Well, welcome to more Foxes Live. Dawn and Phila with us still, Brian as well. And we're also joined by Tim Wass, formerly of the RSPCA. Now, before we carry on and discuss some of the things we've been talking about in our show on Channel 4, we want to find out if anything that you've seen in this series has made you like foxes more or less. So we've got a foxometer. Highly sophisticated bit of kit here. Now, we can measure what you think. So if you're on Twitter, tweet either more or less to hashtag Foxes Live Vote. Or if you're on Facebook, go to our page and type more or less. And then later on in the programme, we'll come back to it and see what the result is. Tonight, we've been talking about the effect we're having on foxes. And I think one of the, certainly from the, all the online feedback that we're having, this huge question about population, first off. Are, are we, by feeding foxes, because we want to get close to them, we want to help them, are we actually kind of making things worse? in terms of increasing the numbers in our towns and cities that becomes a kind of escalating problem? Well, fox density is very, very variable across different cities, so it's very difficult to make an assumption of, of where they're mo more abundant. Um, I mean, if we provide more food and that food is, is greater, it could potentially increase the carrying capacity, the number of animals, and it could increase maybe the survivorship. But we really don't know whether um, the amount of food we're giving is actually supporting more of the population or not because we don't have any idea of how many people are feeding. Well, we're starting to get an idea now and we don't know how many times they feed them or how regularly. So this type of survey will give us an idea of the amount of food that's going in there, how many people are doing it and whether it is potentially you know, increasing the population. But it's very, very difficult to tell without an experimental design where you take away the food and see what happens or you add food you know, we, we aren't doing that and we can't do that really, so we don't really know. But it's why, isn't it, that doing a survey like we're doing is so important because you need to have benchmarks to know whether things are changing. Otherwise, you're going to constantly come back in a few years' time and say, well, we still don't know how many there were when we started. You know, you need to know how many foxes there are I think one, in our towns. One of the things that we can say for certain is that because we are getting a clue for the first time that the public in numbers are feeding foxes, it put, kind of puts a lie to the idea that they're just literally tipping our dustbins open or ripping our black bags apart and causing that kind of a nuisance. People are actually inviting them in, but of course that then brings all of the, the associated problems of the two populations, human and fox, coming into close proximity and some of the issues that we talked about previously. Brian, are you getting a sense from the people that, that you're, you're with, you know, who love foxes, bring them to you, help you with your work, that more people are definitely feeding them? I think a lot of them are, yes. I think the important thing is the health of the population, really. You, you, no matter how big or small your population, you, you should be feeding them good stuff if you're going to feed them. And one of the things I noticed yesterday watching your programme is it's very easy to treat them for mange if you're feeding a fox regularly. You can just put it in the food and it will cure the mange. It'll, it'll kill the mite which spreads that, that disease. And, um, I mean, we give them stuff to keep their teeth healthy, like you would do for, for dogs. You know, basically, if you, if you have a population of these wild animals... It's curious to me, none of us really worried about birds, are we? You know, everybody feeds the birds in the winter to help them get through the winter, because we like having them around us. Well, why wouldn't that apply to foxes as well? Why can we not coexist with this population of fantastic creatures? Can I just come back to you saying the fact that, obviously, the, the accessibility of your feeding foxes, that you can treat them for mange, what do you guys put in their food when you treat well, them? Well, Anne will tell you. I don't know exactly what it is. It's a thing which kills the bugs, basically, okay. which spread the disease. Yeah. Cool. I mean, behaviour as well is important in terms of actually not only giving them nutrition by feeding them, but kind of training them. Uh, aren't we to say here's a reward you come cl really close to us and we'll feed you and it's it's kind of dog training we, we've we've spoken of it before you feed them the foxes don't know the boundaries they don't know that because you've put the food at the bottom of the garden because the uh, PIR light came on for instance it's probably how most people are introduced to foxes in their back garden for the very first time they're in the lounge all of a sudden the 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 back garden lights up and it's a fox. So they feed it and they think it's great to then bring it closer and closer. The children are engaged, which is marvellous, but then they decide to take it the next step and perhaps put the plate down. Well, I'm going to stop you there because it's absolutely the case that they do appear to be getting more brazen, even overstepping the mark, like this one did in Bristol. Just 
the heck, Fox? You can't come into the house, oi! Hey! Tch, 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 tch. Too much. Out you get. Come. Out. Get out, Fox. Naughty Fox. Hey! I mean, that's a fascinating clip, Phil, isn't it? I mean, you've got an animal that's brave enough to want to explore. That's what they have to do to survive. It's coming into a house. They don't understand about windows, doors, our artificial boundaries we put around them. They're just coming and checking stuff out. If, if that fox finds a bit of food in there, it's more likely he's going to come tomorrow and see if there's any more, isn't it? I mean, it's their inquisitive nature which has kind of, like, governed their success. But, I mean, certainly there is evidence that we have, say, from the long-term study in Bristol, that there are enough people feeding them out there that it could potentially be increasing fox, num fox numbers slightly. Um, but there is also this issue that they, there is so much food in the urban environment that if you took it away, the question of whether those foxes could still persist is, is kind of the key one. And the data that we have suggests that although people, lots of people will be feeding them, quite a lot of them are doing it on a fairly ad hoc basis. So certainly when you get to the summer months, which is basically when all the adults are around and all the cubs are pretty much fully grown, that's actually a pinch point because a lot of people go on holiday at that time and this kind of plethora of food suddenly disappears. But what you don't see is a massive increase in the number of problems for those few weeks where suddenly you would think they're actually starving for want of a better word. They actually find other things to eat. There's, there's earthworms, there's beetles, small birds, rodents, pigeons, all of this kind of stuff is there. And for a lot of people, it's the perception is that what people put out is just basically an easy food source. They are adaptable. They will take advantage of that no end. But whether it drives numbers is, is a much more complex question. And we simply, as Dawn was saying, without an experimental manipulation, we can't say for sure. And what's interesting is it's these guys, like the ones at Isha now, they're just hovering on the edge of shop, but they're wandering around their den there. And of course, Brian, your cubs here, these, these are the challenges these guys are going to face literally yeah. within a few weeks' time. It's interesting, you see, you, what you don't see in any of your clips is aggression, isn't it? The, these animals are really built for running, you know, and that's why they're unhappily pursued. You know, they, they're really not aggressive and it takes a lot to make them aggressive. Um, generally, they'll, um, they'll, they'll, be, they, they'll be seen off by your cat or your dog or whatever, you know, as you've seen. Um, so the fact that, that this animal came in, in through her window is kind of neither here nor there to me because she's making an arbitrary decision about what's too far and what isn't, you know. Um, and, that's all, and that's all about exploring. I think one mm. of the things that fascinates me is the fact if you take this on 50 years from now, okay, the kind of big picture by feeding them, providing them with nutrition, nurturing them, providing kind of the rehabilitation resources that we have, our wildlife hospitals mm. like, and, and your kind of sanctuary, Brian, mm. that we end up changing the red fox into a different kind of animal because we kind of are, are we artificially selecting but this is this is not new now. though is it really i mean wouldn't you say that most of the evidence points to the fact that the fox population is self-limiting no matter what we do yeah. seems yeah, to be we, the case whilst we can't look forward obviously we can actually look back and i've read three texts over the last few days in researching this that shows us that in the 18th and 19th century we were importing foxes up to 3,000 through a london market f to service and satisfy the hunting community and at the same time the animals that we have in uh, the same text sorry say that the animals that we have in our countryside without hunting would die out and become extinct because the only reason they were kept alive by gamekeepers was to service the hunt so it's going to be fascinating to look at the next 50 years. No, it isn't. You guys, what do you think? Well, I mean, 50 years now, is... make a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they'll self-regulate and, and I think they'll be quite stable. We've got evidence from some cities uh, where they're quite consistent and other cities they've declined and slightly come back. And so, you know, they, they seem to be quite stable. I don't think we're going to have this mass push unless we change. And urban cities are changing, urban environments are changing and we're changing them and the foxes are adapting to it. So it, it's how we change our environment, how they're going to respond. I love it when scientists disagree. Are you going to I mean, disagree key, or no, not? I think the key point is that looking 50 years into the future is an interesting question. But they've been here for 50 years. So urban foxes turned up kind of really in the 1960s, 70s. 
um, associated with some of the changes that were going on in terms of urban spread at that time. So they've been here for that length of time already. And as Dawn was saying, is that we do have data going back for sort of like 30 years that populations in quite a lot of cities have stayed very stable. And it just seems to me we do need, we need the science, we need to be doing these studies because we kind of, we've got to find a way of living with them. Yeah, yeah. I think you we know, definitely they're not, do. They're not going to disappear, they're going to be here mm. and there are plenty of people who love them. And it's not just about populations, it's about every individual creature. I mean, this little guy matters to me. He's a creature that has a life and, and an expectation. He wants to bring up a family just like we do. Why should we have the right to, to kill them at will? Why, no. that, why, are we, why do we think we're so much more important than any other mammal? or any other creature. Well, that's a powerful thought to end on for now. Coming up, we'll be joined by someone who's not quite as keen on foxes as everyone around this table.